topic of this week lecture is uh, causality in conformal field theory. So, today I will uh, use the tools that I uh, developed last in the last lecture uh, to impose constraints on conformal field theories, mainly uh, three point functions of CFTs in D greater than 2. And this is the outline for the lecture. Yeah, and by the way, Sanjipal, the advantage of having few people is that you can be. Uh, you don't have to be as pedagogical, right? yeah. <laughs> because I think the audience, the, the average level of the audience is quite advanced. <laughs> yeah. First, I'll review causality, basically the first lecture, but keeping CFTs in mind. S second. Now I can be uh, can give you a lightning review of uh, conformal block expansion because I'll need these notations. Next, I'll introduce shockwave states. in CFT and study causality in this kind of states. That will lead to constraints on OP coefficients and then I will conclude. No, the first two shouldn't take that much time, so probably it should be fine. So let's start with our favorite example. We, uh, this is some um, direction y. This is Lorentz in time. There is an operator over here, O1. There is another operator O3 at y equals to 1. And then a fourth operator O4 at y going to infinity. So, this is the light cone. And the four, uh, second operator O2, it is somewhere here with uh, T2, Y2. So, this is uh, just for convenience, let us introduce complex coordinates. So, to compute something like this, to compute a correlator like this, a Lorentzian correlator like this, again first we should start with the Euclidean correlator. Uh, so, this will be a function of y2 and the Euclidean time tau 2 and then again we will have to perform a continuation for tau 2. So, the, to get to the Lorentzian correlator, we have to analytically continue tau 2 to i t2. So, uh, in the last lecture, I showed that 
in the complex tau to plane there are singularities and branch curves. So, we will have to analytically continue somewhere here. So, we will start from somewhere here. So, this is the Euclidean time and so this is the Lorentzian time. If I take this uh, Euclidean correlator and perform this simple analytic continuation, let us call this A. So, that will give me the uh, time ordered Lorentzian correlator. So, this is in practice what we are doing is the following, we are starting with the Euclidean correlator writing this, that in terms of z and z bar and then first we come find this function in terms of Euclidean z and z bar, then we just uh, replace tau 2 by i t 2 and just replace this z and z bar by the Lorentzian value that will give you the uh, time ordered four point function. So, this is A. Uh, I have I should mention one more thing. So, this singularity, so th this singularity corresponds to uh, <coughs> a singularity at z equals to 0 and this is at z bar equals to 1. So, in terms of z and z bar that is where the singularities should be. Now, the second thing that we can do is the following adding continuation. We start from here. We go from, uh, we pass this singularity from the right, but pass this singularity from the left. From the last lecture, this is O3, O2, O1, O4. So, these two, so uh, O2 is time ordered with respect to uh, O1 and anti time ordered with respect to O3. In practice, what we are doing is the following we are starting with the Euclidean correlator. So, whenever uh, we cross a singularity from the left, we have to do something with this. Euclidean correlator. In this case, what you have to do is the following take z bar minus 1 and rotate by 2 pi i. So, take this function, replace z bar minus 1 with this, then plug in the Lorentzian values. So, whenever we cross a singularity from the left, that is uh, what you have to do. Let me give you one more example which will make it uh, more clear. We can also do something like this. So, that is our number C. We computed this thing the last in the last lecture. This gives me something like this. So, if I want to compute this from the Euclidean correlator, we should start with the Euclidean correlator. Now, we are crossing this singularity from the left. So, if you, you can just check that corresponds to this. So, first take the Euclidean correlator, uh, rotate z around 0 and then plug in Euclidean values or sorry plug in Lorentzian values. Yeah, you, you can just plug this thing in in, the, in Mathematica you can just check that that is how z and z bar. Uh, no, no, no. What I mean is that it is not obvious to me that this procedure corresponds to what we are supposed to do. Can 
you like convince us a little bit? Uh, one easy example one can do to uh, convince himself is basically just you can just you can forget about this prescription. You can just do the I epsilon prescription and find out how Z and Z bar uh, behaves when you uh, change the ordering of I epsilon epsilons. We'll see that like one one will rotate Z, one will rotate Z bar, things like that. So this is just like this. This you can just check. Or I can give you one more, I guess, uh, not example. Let me just. So let's say I have a branch cut somewhere here. I can choose either this path or I can choose this path. What I can do, instead of doing this, what I can do is the following. I can just uh, go here and do a rotation around here like this and then follow the previous path. So it's basically, it's, it will give you a rotation of something. It's basically, this is that rotation. Or in I epsilon prescription, it's basically you're just changing the or uh, ordering of epsilons, and because of that, you'll get some kind of uh, in Z and Z bar. If you just check, you'll see that they are they are not the same. What I don't understand is that in general, mm -hmm. the correlation function will not have a cut. This line that you're dry, drawing is going to be just the end of the region of unity. So what does it mean to take and rotate? Is this a prescription which applies only to CFTs and some extra assumptions and so on? So in general, in general, you really have to follow this path and that's it. And there is no other trick. Okay, so probably you saying that in some periods you can use this trick. No, actually, it, this. Sh so this is valid for any K KFTs. Uh, uh, probably the branch cards are confusing. So let let me just ignore the branch cards. So I just have some singularity over here. Then. The, uh, it's basically the analytic continuation is whether you are going, whether you are landing on the imaginary line from the left of the of the singularity or, or from the right of the singularity. It doesn't matter there is a uh, branch cut or not. Okay. So these two are not the same thing. So that's the branch cut basically is telling you that th these two functions they are not the same functions. So now the difference between these two uh, analytic continuation is basically I can just replace this by something like this. It's basically, uh, you can, or these two anti continuations, they are basically related to each other. So this, this procedure over here, it's, it's a, a cartoon for doing something like this. But you don't, you don't have to do that. You, you can just forget about this one, you can just check this one and this one, they are, they are related by something like this. Some example would be helpful. Uh, in the shock wave state, actually, we'll, I'll have one example. Okay, let me just uh, finish this. Add continuation. The fourth one will be this one. Now here there is a subtlety. So first, so this is O1, O3, O2, O4. First, because we are crossing this singularity from the left, you take the Euclidean correlator. So this is something you can just check with mathematics. It's that corresponds to this. But then you have to, you are also crossing this singularity from the left. Uh, this is the same. Oh, no, uh, that, this is not it. Like, I, I'll, that there will be more things. Okay. 
So this is the first thing you have to do. Okay, there's, there is a comma. So now next you guess that you should also rotate z bar minus one in this fashion, but that's uh, not uh, exactly true because after you rotate z by two pi i, this is a different function. So it, this might have a singularity at a different place. So let if I take this, and then I have to check where, where this singularity of z bar, z bar equals to 1 is for this function. So let me just define that this is singular at some point, which is z bar equals to z naught bar. Just it can be 1 or it, it might not be 1. So just I just uh, use this not, uh, z naught for that. So, in the next case, you have to rotate this so that is the fourth one. So, to perform this second uh, step, you have, first of all you have to find out where this z bar, z naught bar is. Now, the statement of causality is the following. Why can't you just start at, instead of analytically continuing from negative tau 2, then you just start from the analytic continuum from, instead of positive tau 2, mm -hmm. you choose negative tau 2, you rotate, and then this second or that last step is completely equivalent to the first step. It's as trivial as for the first step. You just Analytically continue, and you don't need to rotate anything. Okay, so, so if you, you want to start from, you land directly where you need to land. So okay, so that if you, uh, the whole thing okay, is this, this can be. It seems to me that this last situation can be reached mm -hmm. in a completely straightforward fashion from a Euclidean correlator without having to rotate anything, just like the first situation. You just have to start from the negative tau two. That might be the case, but I'm just worried about one thing uh, in. Uh, I'm not sure in in some step if we assume positivity of tau. So we if we start from the assumption that tau two is positive or not. So probably that that might like I'm not hundred percent sure right, right now. Probably like then something else can happen. So then probably the there might be subtleties. I'm not sure of the, that right now. Okay, so then the statement of causality is this z naught bar. This uh, cannot be below z bar equals to one. So the statement of causality is z bar uh, should be greater z naught bar should be greater than or equals to one. So the, this singularity can move in the upward direction, but not in the downward direction. Now, if somebody can show that this function is analytic in this region, let us say, then that should be equivalent of uh, showing that these correlators are causal. So, it, the reason I made the statement is the following. So, in, in practice, you can translate the statement of causality into a statement about analyticity of the correlator. Let me now move to the second review, conformal block expansion. In conformal field theories, we have operator product expansion. So, what we can do, we can uh, use OPs inside a four point function, and that leads to uh, conformal block expansion. Just to give you one, just to uh, set all the notations, if I have four scalar operators.
confirm, conformal invariance tells us that this is this can be written as in the following way. Okay, so let me explain all, all the notations. So, in this case, x12 is x1 minus x2, del 12 is or del ij is del i minus del j, and here it is, this is. So, basically, what we are doing is the following these are all the primaries of the theory. We are writing down this four point point function as a sum over all primaries. And these are OPE coefficients of uh, the scalars with this primary operators, which has dimension delta p and spin l p. And this function is known as this is a known function in principle, these are conformal blocks. Z and Z bar are given in the following way. Let me define U and V. Then z z bar equals to u so this conformal block is a function of this z and z bar variables so what you are going to p uh, p is basically all the primaries of the cft Okay, now let me take a special case of the above four point function. So, now if I have something like this. Let me use the notation g of z and z bar. So, what we, I can do? I can expand in different channels. So, in so so far everything is Euclidean, and for a for an Euclidean correlator, you are allowed to change orders. So, if you can expand, uh, in other words, you can expand in any OP channel that you want. So, I can expand in S channel, which is basically uh, the channel where I am expanding in this OP. Then, G and G bar is given by, or this correlator is written in the following way.
Uh, no. As long as there are different operators, that should be fine. In picture, you can draw a diagram just to just to use as a cartoon for this full expression. So this is S channel expansion where we are summing over all primaries, primary exchanges. Similarly, you can expand in this channel, which we'll call T channel. which will be uh, uh, almost identical to this. So I'm not, uh, not going to write that down. I'm just, I'll just write down, I'll just draw the corresponding cartoon. So this one is basically this. And similarly, there is channel where uh, you expand in this channel, uh, OP, O and Psi. Let me not uh, write that down. It's almost similar to S channel, but it's uh, uh, radius of convergence is different. C alpha, what does it mean? C, this alpha. Uh, alpha. Is it alpha? Uh, no, the last step okay. on the top. Uh, this one? No, no, no. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh sorry, this is infinity, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. Now, crossing symmetry tells us that these different ways of expanding the correlator, they should be the same. It's basically permutation invariance. So the statement of crossing symmetry is S channel plus T channel. Uh, this this looks simple, but as Slava and his collaborators uh, showed us ten years back, that this crossing symmetry can actually be can be a very powerful tool to constrain safeties. In recent years, people use crossing symmetry both analytically and numerically to derive various constraints, but what we have to do is a little different. We have to use crossing when some of the operators are time like separated. And that's, that can be subtle. Now let me move on to deriving actual constraints. For that, I need to define something like a shockwave state. This is, the motivation comes from gravity, mainly from the uh, paper by Kamanho, Edelstein, and Malasina Zaviadov. But it doesn't have anything to do with holographic CFTs. This is true for any CFTs. So what we want is something in CFT that looks like a shockwave. So we define this state. So we take some scalar operator, insert that, insert 
that operator in Euclidean time in uh, Euclidean time delta, but at the center of the spatial directions and act that on the uh, vacuum. So, the, then I will take the limit delta goes to 0. The reason for this uh, offset in the Euclidean direction is because the norm is now finite. And the reason this is called a shock wave state is the following. What I can do? I can take the stress tensor operator and compute its expectation value in this particular state. So, what you can show is the following. So, this expression value in the limit delta goes to 0, it has support over an expanding uh, null shell. So, it is if this is origin, this is my time, this is my, this is any of the spatial direction, it has support only over a null shell. So, basically it is a delta function in the limit delta goes to 0. So, that is why, uh, so it looks like a shock wave, that is why it is called a shock wave state. And what we uh, want to do is basically study causality in this particular state. And as I will show that, this actually gives you uh, non trivial constraints. Uh, excuse me? Yes. Uh, what is the coordinate for the stress tensor? Oh, uh, you, you mean uh, is it Lorentzian or Euclidean? Euclidean? Yeah, it is Lorentzian. Yes. So, but, but in your first papers, I think you did not use this shockwave states. You just used this kind of correlation function. No, we we, we used the shockwave state. This state, yes. The, the reason is basically you need to probe Z and Z bar. Even in the Lorentzian case, you need Z and Z bar to be uh, complex, not real. But there, you know, you insert the parameters at zero to infinity. So it's a very different situation, and still you said that there should be a constraint that the singularity mm -hmm. occurs at z bar less than 1. Yes. So, but that, that constraint should be valid also for this correlator. Yeah, so there is a constraint for that correlator, but that, that does not give you anything non-trivial. This one gives you something, like this one actually gives you some condition on the OP coefficient. Which one? So, uh, this shock wave state. So, that, that condition you cannot translate that, like that is, that's, the reason is basically you can actually check that that condition is, it, it's satisfied, it's, it's very trivial actually. Okay. So, for shock wave state, that condition is non-trivial. Okay, now, what we want is the following. We want to, we, uh, so this is psi insertion at, at the origin, then I have, then I insert another operator O over here. Uh, let me use the coordinate x2 for this one. And this is the light cone for that operator. And there is another O which is somewhere here, let us say, at x3. So, this O is time lag separated with respect to size, and but space lag with respect to this O. So, if I compute this correlator, that should vanish because x2 and x3 they are space like separated. So, that is the statement of causality in this particular state. Now, one uh, might ask, Since we are in the CFT, the, the precise value of delta does not matter. Mm, so Since we are in the CFT, 
the precise value of delta does not you are not you don't have to take the limit delta goes to zero you can keep delta on zero yeah you can keep delta non zeros but all the other distances should be large compared to the delta yes yeah Yeah, this should be true for uh, in any distances, but uh, because we want something like a shock wave, uh, other even otherwise that uh, this uh, condition is true. But for shock wave background, it's it gives you something non-trivial. So delta goes to zero is kind of like uh, a technical uh, thing that we need. In a CFT, you can map this four point function to for some uh, regime of z and z bar. Let me again use the symbol g for this. So what does this causality uh, constraint means for this function g? So that's a precise question that you can ask and I'm trying to, I'll try to address that question. First of all, let me use a different symbol probably. Okay, no, let me use G. Okay. First of all, let me compute or let me uh, tell you what this uh, four point function means. So, you can just show that. Again, what you, what you should do, you, you should start from the Euclidean uh, four point function. Okay, let me not use g here. Let me start with the Euclidean correlator and as a function of complex tau 2, phi tau 2 is the time coordinate for uh, the second operator, you can show that there are singularities here. So, this is for psi i delta for psi minus psi delta and you want to radically continue to some point over here. Now, see they are already shifted because you insert the, these operators in the Euclidean time. Now, what you can do? You can start from the Euclidean time, you can perform this radical continuation. And in terms of z and z bar, if you just plug this thing in Mathematica, you can show that this is basically taking the Euclidean correlator. So, let me. So, okay, z and z, yeah, z and z bar, they are, they are known functions. They are, they are functions of tau 2 and so, you know these functions already. Uh, so, z you have z and z bar. Ah, z and z bar we know, but yeah. not the function g itself. No, you, you don't need that. So, just take z and z bar, yeah. plug this anti continuation in Mathematica, you will see that that corresponds to basically or yeah, it is just, it's just you, can, you can just like you can, if you want a picture probably you need Mathematica. So, you can just show that this is uh, this is basically z that gives you this particular Lorenzian correlator. Let me now use g hat for that. You may just use analytic computation. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now,
let me introduce some new symbols. Let me now write down z as 1 plus sigma and z bar as 1 plus eta sigma where eta is real and it is uh, much, much smaller than 1 and sigma is complex. So, this is useful particularly for the uh, case we are dealing with. Then the, the, the condition that this commutator is 0, you can just translate that into a statement about this function g hat. Just to make sure that if you talk to this about z bar is equal 1. Uh, so, sorry. 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 This is to make a vanity configuration around z bar uh, is 1 as before. Uh, no. So, basically you first analytically continue, yeah. then just plug in this. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. You are just continue. Yes. This is just a redefinition. There is a, so, then you can just show that this statement is equivalent to saying this function in the complex sigma plane. So, this function g hat is analytic in the upper half plane uh, close to sigma equals to 0. So, somewhere here. Because if this function is analytic in this particular region, then while you do analytic continuation, you will not hit any uh, singularity or branch cut and that means all the commutators should vanish if it is analytic. Let me also make a couple of comments. So, the limit eta goes to 0 with sigma fixed, it is the well known light cone limit. And there is one more interesting limit where you keep sigma or eta fixed and take sigma to 0. That goes by the name Bregi limit in CFT. So, so Sanjipa, actually, I am a, I'm a bit lost. Can I be correct a little bit? Because at first you said, you, you told us that four point function is useless because it does not give you anything interesting, it gives you some causality constraints which are obvious. Then you said we should study the shock wave, but mm -hmm. then you said that the shock wave again reduces to the same four point function which you oh, two yeah. minutes before told us was useless. And then you discussed analytic continuations which are very similar to the ones which you discussed before. So, what happened? Okay, so, so what is the new so here? Uh, CFT four point functions, they are not useless. So, the, the, the one we studied first, for like all the points were on the real axis and uh, z and z bar they are real that but so you can map anything to this four point function but the values the regimes of g and z bar they depends on uh, what you started with yeah, okay. so in the first example that we studied you can show that the the z and the uh, lorenz and z and z bar they are always real and in that particular case when z and z bar z bar are always real you you don't get any anything out of causality so what shock wave does is basically even after analytic continuation, they keep z and z bar com complex. So, you are basically uh, exploring different regimes and then in that particular regime, you get constraints. All right. So, now I am going to use the fact that it is, uh, okay, first I will argue that actually reflection positivity and crossing symmetry guarantees that this function is analytic in this uh, regime. So, to do that, let me briefly say what reflection positivity says. It says the following thing. In Euclidean plane, if this is my Euclidean time, this is another Euclidean coordinate. If I have some operator phi 1 here, phi 2, 
pi 3. I can have any number of operators I want. And I have another operator which is a reflection of this uh, along this axis. So I have phi 1 star, but it is a star, phi 2 star, two star, and again I can have any number of operators I want. Tau goes into minus tau. Yes, basically yes. So this, this correlator, the statement of reflection positivity is this correlator is always positive. You can think of this correlator as, as uh, a norm of some state in Lorentzian theory. So th this is a positive correlator. So this is the statement of reflection positivity. The powerful, this is a powerful statement because you can actually smear all these operators with any function you want as long as you do the same thing on the lower half plane. And even then, this should be true. Mm, sorry. Provided the smearing is positive. Uh, even the smear, smearing doesn't have, have to be positive because the same function will appear here. Oh. So it, it, it's true for any function. So that's, this, this is a very uh, powerful statement. So using that, what you can show, uh, so using that, what you can show is the following. You can use the H channel expansion for this function G for the Euclidean function g. So that will go something like this. That there will be some p factor so in the S channel expansion of this correlator g it will go something like this. And this is an uh, this is a complicated expansion because this is actually an infinite series. It does it's uh, doesn't simplify in the like one limit, but using reflection positivity, you can actually show that it doesn't matter what this expansion is. These coefficients, all of them, should be positive. So the statement of reflection reflection positivity actually tells you something about the expansion uh, S channel expansion of the correlator. From there, you can show that this function g hat, which is the function after adic continuation, that's bounded by its first sheet value, or bounded by the Euclidean value of the correlator with some p factor again, which is finite. But we know that uh, this Euclidean correlator, because of the because S channel expansion, this thing converges in this particular regime. We know that this is finite. Sir, uh, mm -hmm. so I I understand this. So I think I understand this bit. So, so I understand this statement in terms of z z bar coordinates, mm -hmm. right? So in terms of z z bar. Like on the left where you wrote that G Z Z on mm -hmm. KT and we call G hat. So then then I understand it would be true with prefactor one. Absolute value of G hat would be less than mm -hmm. G. Yes. Right? But when you go to this sigma eta coordinates, this is less clear to me. It's, it, if if you want if you want you can just write Z and Z bar here. That's it's it's, it's just releveling. It's it, it's it doesn't do anything. Uh, tricky. It's a. Well, I don't see how it's relevant. Uh, how what's relevant? Yeah, but why is there a prefactor? Why is it not just one? Ah, so, yeah. So that's what you generally. Uh, that's what you expect that, that this prefactor should be one, but there is a problem with uh, convergence of this uh, expansion. So we want something uh, close to z equals to one or z bar equals to one. So. This this expansion is not uh, convergent, so we have to use the row expansion. So if you use the row expansion where everything converges and uh, everything looks nice, then there should be a, a condition that the G or we call it H of rho and rho bar. This is less than this, something like that. So then, if you just go back from rho to 
z and that, that gives you some p factor that, that's that doesn't do anything but like it, the only thing that you have to check is if this p factor is large or small it, it's basically a finite thing so that means because on uh, the euclidean correlator that that's convergent so that means even the uh, g hat function should be analytic in this particular regime so that gives us the slogan reflection positivity plus crossing that gives you causality. Now, I will. I don't see, but if you show that it is bounded, but you said you have to show that it was an analytic. Uh, okay, so there I am using this uh, term analytic in a loose way. So, what I mean is the following. So, if this uh, G is uh, finite in some uh, regime. Basically, we don't expect the, to have a branch curve over there. Uh, you, in, uh, for a function, you can have that, but uh, probably can, I can say that it's it's more of an assumption for us that they, the, all the branch curves they, they come with a singularity. But most analytic functions, yeah, but like square root z, they are bounded. Yes, and they, even though they have branch curves. Yeah, they have branch curves, but generally we expect in uh, for from a Euclidean uh, correlator we expect to have a branch curve whenever we hit a light cone. So in in, in that sense, basically we don't expect like, whenever we hit a uh, light cone, will the uh, correlator should also be singular. So we so Why? you can have a subleading singularity, which is like a square root like singularity near the light cone. I think such examples can only be cooked up. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, oh yes. So that's why it's, it's an assumption. So we are just we are just talking about singularities, which uh, we are talking about branch curves, which comes with singularity. So th that's something we have to uh, assume. But can you explain why do you take this assumption? This assumption seems to be completely ad hoc. Why you know you said that somehow CFT makes you suggest that you should take it, but can you? Like, can you say a few words? No, I don't see any connection whatsoever. Why? Because we have a CFT, this assumption is somehow reason. It, it's basically like uh, we, we are only doing, uh, talking about uh, singularities which come from. Uh, we are basically talking about uh, singularities that come from light cone and branch curves there which also come from light cone. So that's in that that's why we, for us it's sufficient to uh, discuss this. It, it might not be m most general thing. But what we are basically explaining. Uh, we are trying to make a very general statement which is going to apply to any CFT. So, uh, like, if, like in the end, you are going to try to argue that you proved this collider bounds. Mm -hmm. so in the end, you proved collider bounds not for all CFTs, but for just some special class of CFTs which satisfies some special ad hoc assumption, then why is this interesting? I mean, you should try to. They justify this assumption. Okay, so Why is it physically reasonable? Okay, let I me don't see any physical justification. Okay, so th that assumption in this picture is basically th this one. So, for the uh, Euclidean correlator, it will be it will uh, see a singularity in a branch cut when it hits this light cone. All. I'm uh, assuming is the following. So this singularity over here, the after I perform uh, this z rotation, only thing I'm uh, uh, saying that this singularity doesn't move on the left of it. So this light cone singularity over here, it doesn't move here. Because if it does, then what will happen when I approach the other operator O? After approaching this point, I have to perform two, I can, uh, in principle, I can perform, perform two different analytic continuations. So that. But have you proven this? I don't see how you prove it. You so prove that uh, this function is bounded in that region. So but I prove that there is no singularity here, yes. But if it have, if it have any 
it it can have non analytic series non analytic series but only thing i'm saying so this singularity this this one didn't move here that that uh, and there in principle there can be other uh, non analytic series we ha we are ignoring them so only thing we care about is this light cone singularity Why do you say singularity? We are not interested in singularity. We are interested in non analyticities. Did you prove that non analyticity did not move? Well, uh, no, no I, I singularity I, is the beginning of a of a branch cut. Mm -hmm. So did you prove that the beginning of the branch cut did not move? No, uh, that that statement I didn't prove. Uh, that statement I didn't prove. I just proved that uh, uh, position uh, the begin uh, that singularity didn't move. That that I proved. Perhaps this can be proved. I don't know. It seems. It seems perhaps. Perhaps it just follows by an, a, a simple extension of your argument because, like, instead of saying that this function g hat is bounded by something, could you just argue that the series which defines this function converges, and so the function is analytic? Could you could you make such an argument? Because this inequality is also true term by term. So you know that mm -hmm. the term which defines the function g converges, the, fu the series which defines the function g converges, and x to p converges, and, and this function g hat is defined by the same series with some phases. phases. And so if that series converges, the series also converges, and so it defines an analytic function. So basically, not only do you have this inequality, but you could, in fact, indeed argue by the same argument that the function is analytic. So I, I retract my objection. Uh, uh, there might be subtleties, but I, pro like probably if what you are saying is true, but there might be subtleties. Uh, when shall I stop? How, how much time do I have? Uh, well, we, we got interrupted a lot, so you can yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that will that will do. Okay, now. Let me just use the fact that on the upper half plane, this g hat is analytic. So I'll take some semicircle and perform this contour integral, and that should be zero. So this circle is of radius r. Fat, I'm working in the limit eta much, much less than r, much, much less than 1. So uh, I take eta to 0 first, then I take r to 0. So now, what you can do is the following. So along this arc, we actually know this function g hat. So this arc is the light cone limit. So what you can do, you can just start with g as uh, the identity exchange plus, let's say, just the stress tensor exchange. So in the light cone limit, you can, so this is the uh, leading non-trivial contribution. So then you can just compute g hat in the limit 
eta goes to 0, then sigma goes to 0. This goes some as 1 plus eta over sigma uh, i times some p factor lambda t, where lambda t is up to some coefficients c psi psi t c o o t, this op coefficients. So now, because I know that, I can just perform the integral over here. And what that gives you, gives me is the following. So, this is the integral along this line. And this is basically dominated by the Regi limit. So, you can think of this as some kind of an optical theorem where you relate the light cone limit with the Regi limit. But we do not actually know much about this function g hat. Is this pi the first symbol? Uh, in front, before lambda t, what is this symbol? Uh, which, which is written there? This one? This no, no, below no, the equation. Lambda t eta, but what multiplies it in front? Pi. Ah, it's pi. Yeah. Okay, so again, just from reflection positivity, from this, you can show that this g hat. So, whenever we are, I am talking about the four-point function, I am actually talking about the normalized four-point function, where I am normalizing with respect to the two-point functions. So, from reflection positivity, you can also show that this g hat eta sigma on the real line it is bounded by 1. So, that means this lambda t has to be positive. So, that is the constraint that you get from causality. Uh, but if I uh, stop here, uh, probably Slava will yell at me because uh, this lambda t is basically the product of this OP coefficients. And from what identity we know that we know this OP coefficients and they are all this product is automatically positive. So, by doing all this we basically derive something which is which is which follows from what identity, but we can do more. We can make this statement a uh, little stronger. What we can show is the following. It does not matter if these operators have, uh, if these operators O, they have spin or not, as long as this g hat can be written in the following way. With some power. So, as long as uh, this second term is growing in the limit sigma goes to 0, but small because of some parameter there is a constraint on the coefficient that appears in front of it. So, that is the state, statement of causality. So, if, whenever you have something like this, where you have a term which is small but growing, there, should, there is a constraint. And this, uh, there is a, uh, there is one more uh, condition that you can derive, which is actually very important. You can also, also show when this second term is growing, it cannot grow faster than 1 over sigma. It can go, grow only as fast as 1 over sigma. That also follows from uh, the fact that this uh, function g is analytic in this regime. So, let me now uh, sum, uh, sum, let me now summarize all the results.
Okay, when I have external scalar operators, and let me assume that so these O's are scalars, and let me assume that there are obviously we have the identity operator, we have stress tensor, but uh, let me also assume that you have many other uh, conserved currents. Exactly conserved, yes. Because uh, in the light cone limit, only operators which are uh, conserved will contribute, because everything else will come with a higher power of eta. So, these are the things that, that follows from our causality constraint. First of all, if you have a spin 1 conserved current, let me call that J, there is no constraint. The reason is, uh, you, can just, you can just show that if for a spin 1 exchange, G hat goes like this, 1 plus i, or for any spin, spin exchange, it goes like this, L, L minus 1 times 2 is over 2. So, for L equals to 1, there is no sigma term. So, this second term is not growing. So, there is, because of that, there is no constraint. For T, it's basically, as I showed earlier, it's C for OT, C psi psi T, it's positive, which as I explained before, it's trivial. And for higher spin exchange, any finite number of them ruled out. So, you cannot have finite number of higher spin conserved currents. Uh, this is in, in, in D equals 3, this, uh, this was, was proved by Maldasena and Zavyadov and then it was generalized for higher dimensions, but for us it is basically a simple consequence of causality. No? Uh, how? Can you explain how it follows from Ah, from, from here. So, if you have a spin, let us say 4, so this will go as 1 over sigma cube, but, but it can never grow, grow faster than 1 over sigma. It is basically that you can, uh, you, you can just show from the fact that this is analytic in this regime, you can use something like maximum modulus principle to show that only thing that is allowed is basically 1 over sigma, if it is analytic in that regime. But somehow infinite number of them is allowed and there is Okay, so if you have infinite number of them, if you like, if you, you what you can do, you can basically, uh, uh, you can eliminate the one with the highest spin first. So, if, if there is a highest spin, you can, you can eliminate that. But if you have an infinite number of them, so basically like th that argument will not work. So, you can just sum them up prob and after that, so, individual terms can be actually more singular, but after summing them up, they, they can be, uh, they, they can uh, grow at a slower rate, basically, and that is allowed. What I am confused about is that how the theory with infinitely many currents is going to satisfy your constraints. Which constraint? So, I ruled out only the, so I, I just ruled out there cannot be a high, high, highest uh, conserved spin. What will G hat look like if you have infinitely many curves? That depends. So, so, then you have to tell me about everything about the theory. So, so if, even if you have uh, an infinite number of conserved current and you sum all of them up, the entire thing cannot go faster than 1 over sigma. So, that is the condition. Now, for external spinning operator, you 
let me just quote the results. So, if J is a spin 1 kinds of current and T is the stress tensor, just from conformal invariance, you can sh this three point function is fixed up to uh, two uh, coefficients. So, these are known tensor structures and they come with some coefficients which are not fixed and a priori they can be anything. Similarly, stress tensor three point function they come with three coefficients. In, uh, in D equals to three they come with there, there are only two structures. But in general there are three structures in any other dimension. But in D equals to three you can have a parity odd structure. So yeah in, even in D equals three you have three structures. Uh, sorry, hmm? So, this, this coefficients or this is? Uh, so, if I, if I write down uh, anything with a subscript S here or, or, or these things, they are basically known tensor structures. I am just not writing them down. So, they are, they are just known structures. So, the point is all these three point functions, they are fixed. Only, the, only thing that you can change is basically this coefficients. This is not correct to explain. So, th this S F refers to Take a theory of a free scale yeah. of a free fermion, and, and then and then this is a particular example and tells you that it can be used as a basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, then if you just perform uh, the same procedure but with spinning spinning external operators, you you can show the following. Okay, let me just use any. So, all of them should be positive. So, uh, conformal inference does not tell you about the sign of this coefficients, but causality tells you that they should be positive. So, that is the consequence of causality. Yes, yes. But these constraints, they are actually very interesting to a lot of people. So, we and uh, Another group, we derived this from causality in 2016. And in the same year, uh, this were derived using unitarity. In fact, th this were deriving, th this were derived using uh, deep inel inelastic scattering. Basically, these are unitarity bounds by Kulaksizi, Parnachev, uh, Kovartgorsky, and Zevyadov in 2016. But interestingly, these constraints were, were first derived by uh, uh, Hoffman and Maldasena in 2008 uh, using averaged. No energy condition. So, this is a condition. Uh, let me see if I okay. So, the average non energy condition is the statement that T minus minus. Where x minus is uh, null coordinate, this is a positive operator. So, if you or expression value of this is positive. So, if you start from this uh, condition, you can just derive them. So, that made us wonder if, if we can actually derive this average knowledge condition directly from causality. And the, and the answer is yes, and that will be the topic of the next lecture. So, uh, let me now summarize because we are already out of time. Okay.
Assalamualaikum. So we uh, studied shockwave states in CFT. And from there, we showed that causality is equivalent to some statement about analytic, city, analytic structure of the correlator. Then the second statement is, if you start with a reflection positive, and crossing symmetric Euclidean theory. Uh, that guarantees that the, uh, the correlator is analytic in the regime where it should be. So that gives you causality of the Lorentzian theory. Then, using the same analytic, uh, property of the correlator, we derive constraints on the interactions of low dimensional operator. irrespective of uh, what happens in the UV. Then, uh, also we ruled out finite number of higher spin conserved current. And finally, we showed that these constraints are equivalent to, and these constraints are related to the averaged Null energy condition. Which I will discuss in the next lecture. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Questions. See, is it important they are exactly conserved those currents? Or if you have a larger larger models? The currents are just barely not conserved. Mm, sorry for that. Uh, it's important, it was important to rule down to conserve currents, they are exactly conserved. Uh, if you look at theory which are, you know, like you have one over n uh, mm -hmm. uh, deviation uh, from exact conservation. Yeah, for, for us, it, they have to be exactly conserved. So, but if, if there are operators which are nearly conserved, probably you can use all these uh, 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 tricks there. Uh, we haven't tried tried that yet, but I, I I would guess that you can actually say something non-trivial. Yeah. 